Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the forum. Uh, I'm very pleased to have with us today Mr. Shan Ahmed Khan. Uh, Shan is a scholar of international law, um, and he is uh, also previously he served with the Research Society of International Law and is a consultant to the ICRC. Uh, we're certainly lucky that we've got him just before he leaves for his LLM at Harvard. Uh, welcome, Shan. Thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. So, Shan, today the discussion for our viewers uh, will be looking at the fundamental principles or cardinal principles of uh, international humanitarian law, and these are really the core uh, principles uh, behind which, uh, upon which, really the structure of IHL is constructed. So, what I wanted to really ask you for our um, uh, for our viewers is. Uh, could you give a basic introduction to what these cardinal principles are and and how they really impact you know uh, the application of IHL uh, on those lines so so it's very interesting in the sense that IHL has really actually when you look at the very core principles it's based on mm, in 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 a large sense on morality in the sense that there are principles of humanity. So, for example, if you look at the Hague Convention from 1899, you see the Martin's Clause and how it talks about the dictates of public humanity and public conscience, things like that. So, effectively, when we look at it, we don't necessarily have to be lawyers to understand, you know, the principles or the very fundamentals of IHL. So, effectively, what is IHL about? IHL is essentially about striking a balance between military necessity and humanity. Now, I don't need to elaborate on what humanity entails. It entails what any lawyer would say, what any person would say. That's very obvious. What is military necessity? So military necessity would be any measure that is necessary to accomplish a legitimate military purpose and is not prohibited by IHL. Now, the very focus of IHL is to mitigate the suffering in armed conflict. Effectively, when we look at the use at bellum framework, which is uh, the framework which concerns the use of force, the aim is to never go to war. IHL then comes in when war begins. And what it does is it seeks to strike a balance between state interests, which would be known as military necessity and humanity in order to mitigate suffering. So these are effectively the main two principles upon which IHL is based. Excellent. No, thank you so much. And I've always found this fascinating. It's really this this dialectic or this conflict really between uh, or, or striking a balance, in other words, uh, between military necessity and, and uh, humanity. And it's, uh, you know, what, you know, I find to be the most fascinating as aspect of IHL, where we recognize that, uh, you know, warfare takes place, uh, armed conflict takes place. But how within that context um, do we then uh, ensure that the rules do not lead to, you know, excessive harm or superfluous injury or, uh, you know, doesn't it impact civilians uh, in the sense that it would normally do. And then that's something that I find, you know, uh, fascinating there. Um, I just wanted to discuss, uh, you know, the, the other principles in addition to humanity, military necessity, things like distinction, proportionality, precaution. Could you uh, briefly explain those as well? So effectively, those would, in, in a sense, come under military necessity. So when you take those actions, you have to be mindful of the very purpose of IHL, the very foundation, which is humanity. So how do you sort of preserve while retaining that military necessity? How do you preserve the you know, the notion of humanity? So you do it through distinction between civilian and military objects. Effectively, a military object is anything which by its nature, purpose, location or use makes an effective contribution to military action and offers a definite military advantage. Now, the word definite is very important and we'll obviously get into those things later on. But the word definite entails sort of an objective criteria which must be adhered to by states. And then we have proportionality. Any attack which may be ex expected to cause incidental loss of civilian lives, injury to civilians, damage to civilians, which would be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated. So effectively, no attack if it's so if there is a certain military advantage anticipated mm -hmm. you can only go in so far as whatever incidental loss occurs within that framework you cannot go beyond that and then finally in terms of rules of targeting we have article 57 of the additional protocol one which talks about precautions so effectively you need to give warnings you need to verify your targets and you need to ascertain the nature of the object before any strikes take place Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> now, I know one of the biggest issues, uh, you know, when we look at IHL and its application today is is on compliance by armed forces. Um, in your assessment, um, how do you feel? Uh, I know I have a lot of views on this because I've studied a lot of these, uh, you, you know, how armed forces are, are applying um, international humanitarian law, and especially these, these core principles. How do you feel 
you know the the compliance is faring globally on this i know it's a, it's a big question so, but in so, general so in in my view ihl or or rather the geneva convention and the framework as a whole is supposed to be you know this guiding light that gives us that direction and then effectively it delegates the <coughs> sense of duties to the states as well now for example i can talk about the british military manual which gives very specific examples for example in the context of cultural property it gives real life examples that okay soldiers can do this in in certain situations and they cannot do this in certain situations now because soldiers are by their nature not trained to be lawyers it is very very important that states sort of take those principles and make them sort of digestible to the audience which is the intended audience would be would be the military and apart from that we need that deterrence mechanism a mechanism which is also talked about within the geneva convention mm-hmm. we need repression of grave breaches so effectively you know states making laws in terms of you know prosecuting war crimes whether it's universal jurisdiction or anything of that nature that's very very important because one it comes to understanding whether through dissemination or anything of the sort and two through deterrence so in my opinion there are other factors but in my opinion these two for me are the most important no absolutely and it's really important that you 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 mention that point because you know the primary obligation for um, holding people accountable is with states it's not the you know there there's a wrong full assumption that it's the icc that's going to solve all these problems or it's these ad hoc tribunals that we have that will you know hold these people to account but it, the primary obligation um, remains the states um and that's where a lot of you know some of this confusion and the issue of impunity really comes in um just you know two cents on on this point i think modern armed forces um how they comply uh, and their level of compliance is really uh really varies from from country to country uh we've seen countries with very you know developed legal systems and and uh, armed forces having very you know robust um compliance mechanisms right they they'll they'll be a legal decision maker uh, on aspects of ihl uh, you know uh, at the time of targeting uh and other armed forces are are less uh developed in that regard but <clears throat> you know uh, it also depends i think uh, a lot on the traditions and culture of armed forces absolutely so uh, we do see for example you know in 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 south asia uh, with the with the british that has left this heritage of uh, uh, the armed forces here um that there are a lot of principles of ihl that are ingrained in the culture and the um you know ethos of militaries whether it's pakistan india uh, you know bangladesh etc uh, in the region so it's it's good to see that um my next question is on non state actors you know so non you know affiliated with with the state armed forces we're seeing more and more non international armed conflicts they they're the bulk of armed conflicts today um and we're seeing non state actors becoming ever more sophisticated right and taking over territory controlling that territory and and you know uh, with uh, you know all around the world uh, that's happening how do you feel that we can ensure non state actors complying with ihl as well so i i i feel the my opinion might be a bit controversial but i i i feel there is a sense of treating non state actors differently so sometimes we 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 term them as a, term them as terrorists sometimes it's organized armed groups sometimes it's militias we need to also see the nature so for example national liberation movements they are recognized as legitimate so in in some occasions it's also important to see sort of the goals that they've set out so for example some non state actors are looking for legitimacy and how can that legitimacy be obtained if the state with which it is in an armed conflict if that state complies in so far as their dealings are concerned with the non state actor i feel there will be a reciprocal uh, arrangement because those state actors want a sense of legitimacy whether it's to win people's hearts or the, mm. the people there so in that sense i i feel it is very very important for the state to comply irrespective of whether non state actors comply with ihl or not to sort of build that narrative and and apart from that i i think it's also very very important that they are trained and then we we've, we've seen in the past you know uh, from examples from algeria and other states where non state actors have voluntarily given deeds or you know deeds of commitment under ihl so in terms of that i feel what's very very important is to engage and see you know the mindset of those non state actors how they function and if you mold the narrative around that so if you you know give them legitimacy if you give them those now i'm not saying that terrorists should be given legitimacy i am just saying for example you have national liberation movements you have those movements so if you comply with ihl in in terms of the dealings between them i i feel 
that makes sort of a good impact on on compliance and apart from that dissemination obviously plays a big role that, that's a very imp- interesting point you make so essentially i think uh, you know you you're saying that the state has an obligation to at least entice or encourage um, compliance by uh, by non state actors that they might be in a armed conflict with um and there also raises the question of um you know legitimacy and and why that might be problematic for some states but uh, i think it really points to the issue of reciprocity and you know all international relations really function on reciprocity but even within a non international armed conflict situation you know when the state reciprocates by abiding by the rules of war that is where you expect then you know the the non state actor to also do that because it is in their own selfish interest to do so exactly, right? exactly. beyond the the other moral ethical and, and, obligations and, and i think it's also beneficial for the state because effectively it's it's more often than not the case that there is some level of pop the support of the population within certain regions as with the non state actors <coughs> the sympathies might be attached so when a state acts in line with international you know apart from the legal aspects the political narrative shifts and that shift is very beneficial for the state and that shift or that pressure could also compel the non state actors to start or to force them into compliance with ihl this is obviously there is there's much more of a debate on it and whoever is interested i would encourage you to go see the work of geneva call they are doing some interesting work uh, with regards to non state actor and compliance of ihl so definitely give their publications a, a go no oh, absolutely um <clears throat> so i just wanted to go to uh, another aspect of our discussion now ihl and, and especially its cardinal principles has really been this this wonderful tool for for lawyers academics policy makers practitioners um to be able to i mean it gives us the language to 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 know when something is wrong in war right to to be able to criticize and critique um wrongful action and also to encourage you know positive action and adherence to to the law but one of the criticisms that you know a lot of people have had um is that these rules these cardinal principles they're wonderful on paper but they're so complex or they're so in you know um indeterminate abstract in nature that in real life situations when there's a commander on the field he has to take a decision it becomes extremely complex and difficult for them to apply this i mean the concept of say um, you know determining proportionality military necessity how are you going to weigh that against human life civilian life um and is that a you know a, a type of calculation that can actually even be done right so so my question here is do you think these rules and the ways in which they've been framed inject too much uncertainty and subjectivity um into uh, you know the rules which should be anything but uncertain and should be uh, you know determinate so so i i think my answer would be both a yes and a no but for that i think we we really have to go to the background of the convention so states as international legal persons they have certain priorities now we we know the geneva conventions were made with the backdrop of the world war so states had that appetite to enter into agreement to enter into a convention at that time yes there was appetite but states at the same time do not also want to be restricted in that sense they they want that certain level of leeway in terms of making those decisions and especially in situations where there is an armed conflict now having said that uh, the the 1977 additional protocol for example gives wording which is in my opinion not necessarily as legal mm-hmm. so for example it it talks about <clears throat> very objective may be expected definitive military advantage so these are some of the things which i feel a military commander can make and if we we also see reference of that in legal instruments as well so for example we we if we see the uh 1954 convention on cultural property if we see the second protocol from 1999 we see that when it comes to attacking those properties uh cultural properties uh so for example i'll i'll give you specific examples Art- article 6 of the 1999 protocol to the hague convention allows decisions to be made by an officer commanding a force equivalent of a battalion or larger similarly those under special protection in the 1954 convention it requires the officer commanding a division and finally if something is under enhanced protection under the 1999 protocol on cultural property the decision must be made by the highest operational level of command now okay, wow. these are some of the things that should be kept in mind and apart from that when states sign on to a particular convention it is their obligation to comply with it in good faith now that means and that comes back to the point that i made earlier it is very very important for states to first make this training available have 
within their deployment have you know legal experts who can make those decisions on ground and assess it on an objective basis and in so far as is they are doing that in good faith i think you will see that more often than not they will arrive at the right conclusion no absolutely and uh, you know that's a really important point that you make and i think goes back to you know the point that you were making earlier the the balance between military necessity and humanity um we can have very certain rules and you know clear cut rules but that might make war unworkable right and that would then discourage states from actually you know signing up to uh conventions such as these or additional additional protocols uh if you will and so i re- i really think that part of that balance um is you know having language that is workable in a real life context absolutely and i think that's where the contradiction lies so many of the the articles that i read on you know the the rules being too broad and things like that you do see that there is never a solution and then at the same time you have people criticizing the geneva conventions for you know being too old not being fit for purpose at the moment so inherently there's that tension where people want the conventions to stay contemporary and they also want the conventions to be specific if in 1949 and if in 1977 they made a list of things where proportionality they made hypothetical scenarios mm-hmm. and restricted it in some manner i i think the developments we're seeing now with whether it's you know autonomous weapons whether it's cyber warfare things like that i think the convention would have a hard time ad- adopting to them and and that's sort of my understanding of it and another thing which i feel in in terms of literature that i feel missing is you know that disconnect between public international law and ihl mm-hmm. so normally ihl scholars <clears throat> tend to you know see it very separately from public international law but you know conventions and things like that so whether it's a you know a convention a covenant anything of the sort an international agreement they are not to be interpreted at in accordance with the time that they were made they are to be interpreted at the time when they are being you know uh, interpreted so for example if the geneva conventions are from 1949 if you have a situation before you you will improvise and you will interpret it as to how it applies today today yeah and that's extremely important because what would you see in that you will see how states have reacted to particular positions whether states have expressed their disagreement on a certain action and through that the corpus develops now if i give you an example in in terms of cyber warfare we've seen the talent manual mm-hmm. now obviously the talent manual which regulates you know the usad bellum and usin bello aspects of cyber warfare that uh is not a legally binding document but at the same time it draws its inspiration from instruments like the charter which is old instruments like the geneva conventions which are old and then it builds by analogy and extends it to those provisions now at the same time if you take that picture and if you think in 1997 you know articles 51 or 52 were restricted that would not have been possible so it's because of that that i think that the conventions have played a great part and i think obviously as time progresses they will be able to meet the challenges and we also have to see that in terms in practical terms now what do i mean by that the appetite that states had in 1949 we we do not have that kind of appetite so if someone is thinking obviously it's great if you have an additional protocol 5 and 6 as you mentioned mm-hmm. but that's realistically not going to happen today so what do what are we left with we are left with these rules that through subsequent <clears throat> practice and through development of the law we can apply to situations that come today and i think uh the the recent launch of the commentaries of the third geneva convention and the whole project i think has done a great job because it has started that debate about you know 70 71 years on what does the geneva convention give us and that debate obviously it has had its critics it has had its supporters but i think the great thing that it has done is start this debate on how do we take the geneva conventions forward and i think that's very very important well, i think uh, you know you make a absolutely critical point there that you know it doesn't matter what the date is at the end of uh, the convention uh, the conventions uh, it really matters how we can apply this uh, in our modern day you know looking at these as living documents looking at these absolutely. as documents that can continue to apply and and we can continue to reinterpret uh, whenever the need arises my last question for you uh, before we leave and you've already touched upon it briefly is the issue of 
do you feel that these principles that we currently have are adequate to the challenges of tomorrow or really the challenges of today with things like uh, cyber warfare or um, war in space autonomous weapons you discussed some of these previously but um do we need to look at ihl or reframe it in a different way for this particular context or have additional sets of uh, principles developed i mean i mean the question comes down to practicality if if uh, someone gives me the choice of having a new binding set of rules i think me personally i i would take it but then do we have that choice for example in autonomous weapons we we see this very weird conundrum in in my opinion where you criminal responsibility becomes an issue because how do you prosecute autonomous weapons right like these mm-hmm. are very basic questions that perhaps even a non lawyer has so in that sense it's very ideal but in another sense the rules made are broad enough to cover all of these developments they may not do it perfectly but they are the option we have and i think that is very very important where states have a rule to take this step forward now by analogy states have slowly started giving their positions within the framework of the un charter about how international law applies to cyberspace states are free to do that states are free to talk about how ihl applies to cyberspace and that is where the obligation of applying treaties in good faith comes in because it's not just about the convention it's about the parties that make the convention work so if they take those steps if they take steps to clarify certain positions i think it is <clears throat> as a broad structure under the framework of the geneva conventions i think those challenges can be met thank you so much for such an interesting discussion i mean we can go on uh, on these topics for quite some time but i know you have to be be off thank you so much shan for joining us no happy to be here